So welcome to this very short video describing the new classification system for chronic sinus disease that's been proposed by the EPOS 2020 group led by Witzke Fockens and her fantastic effort here. And it's really an attempt to move us away from the very limited description of chronic sinus disease as being with or without polyps. Uh, our understanding of sinus disease and the treatment options available now are well beyond this. And so um, a new system was now, I have to give a shout out to my colleagues, um, in particular, Jessica Grayson, who was a fellow with us who works at uh, the University of um, Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, with some colleagues, including Brent Senior, Claire Hopkins, Eri Mori, who helped put together uh, this proposal. It, the first step of this proposal is really describing, you know, whether or not the sinus disease being observed is a primary respiratory disorder. That means that there's no other secondary issues what's going on. So, you know, if you have a cystic fibrosis and you happen to have sinus disease, well, it's, you don't really have chronic sinusitis, you've got cystic fibrosis. It's, it is the, it, it, the sinus disease is secondary to a broader condition going on. Or likewise, if you have a focal tumor in the sinuses, you might have some obstructed sinuses around the tumor. Well, that, that's not a primary CRS. That, that really is a secondary condition because there's a local pathology. So here, what we see most of as ENT surgeons is a concept that patients come to us, they really have inflammation in their respiratory system that's not a result of some other factors going on either locally or in the body. So this is what we call primary CRS. And the first step here is to say, you know, what is the anatomical distribution? The first top one is whether it's localized and localized means it follows the, the functional anatomical unit. So, so either just the, 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 the sphenoid or the posterior ethmoid gets involved or, or the frontal anterior eth ethmoid and maxilla get involved because they all relate to the osteomedial unit. So it's, a, it's almost always a unilateral phenomenon and it, and it highlights that these patients are likely to have some sort of local anatomical issue involved in the pathogenesis. And it also means that they also are likely to have surgery early on in the piece as part of their treatment paradigm. The diffuse patients though, it doesn't mean pansinusitis. It just means that, that the inflammatory changes observed don't follow an anatomical pattern. So they may, they may be patchy and diffuse. Now, when I say anatomical pattern, I mean, they don't follow a functional anatomical pattern. So if you've got a little bit in the front, a little bit in the posterior ethmoid and a little bit in the, in the sphenoid, this, this are, they, they don't drain through each other. They're, they're, not, they're, they're really functionally separate compartments. And, and so therefore, if you have that, then you have some sort of diffuse process. And, and not always, but mostly this is a bilateral condition. Let's talk then about endotype dominance. Endotype dominance is important because the, the treatments we have available and that are emerging now in, in, on the market, everything from current local treatments right through to biologics, really probably separate out into TH2 type disease treating agents and non-TH2. And that's where our understanding also is. We really understand a lot about TH2 disease. And although we understand that non-TH2 comprises several entities, at the moment, I don't think we know enough to really break it out, nor do we have treatments that really allow us to break it out. So at the moment, it's just down as non-TH2. Um, and in the future, this may expand, but I think it's a sensible dominance right now. So the final part of this then is the clinical examples or, or the phenotypes. And these are really just for us to show what are the descriptions of sinus disease that have already been made in our literature? How do they fit in with this system? Now, the first one of a localized TH2 dominant condition is allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. So in this condition, you can see this young 17 year old boy who's atopic has developed a fungal reaction in his left maxillary sinus. He has the classic hyperdensity material. And when you operate and open up the sinus, he's got this fungal mucin. Now this is really a condition that relates anatomically to the inability to clear fungal containing mucin in someone who has 
a hypersensitivity to fungal elements. Now, if you might say, why does the right side is normal in someone who has a hypersensitivity condition? Well, the, the mucus clearance mechanisms are working well there, and therefore the fungal containing mucin clears quickly from the sinus and never sits around long enough to induce the reaction that we see in the left maxillary sinus. So this is a great example of a localized TH2 driven condition. And once again, being localized, surgery is, is is a key part of the early paradigm and management for this person. Let's look at the non-TH2 group. So this is people who have just a simple osteal occlusion or, or isolated sinusitis. Now these are patients who present to us with just more an infective phenomenon um, and is just not medically reversible. There are reasons why some of these patients develop simple osteal occlusion this affects then the ventilation and drainage of this sinus cavity, and they may develop edema, fibrosis, um, other changes in the submucosa that just are not medically reversible at some point in time. And they don't have a TH2 change. You can see in figure part C here, they've got like a more of purulent secretions. And if this can't be broken with medical treatment, then surgery plays uh, an early and critical role um, in the management of these patients. So this is our classic, very traditional concepts of isolated sinus disease. Let's move on to the diffuse group. So these are patients who generally have bilateral disease. Now, once again, diffuse does not mean pan sinusitis where everything's grayed out. It just means that the process doesn't restrict itself to known anatomical functional groups in the sinus. The TH2 conditions are really now these three. Um, central compartment atopic disease, as originally described by John Delgadio, um, is really an exuberant allergic rhinitis. And these patients present like this. This, is in the, this description is in the new EPOS 2020 guidelines. In, in this group, these patients develop jelly-like edema and polypoid change in the central part of their nose or the medial part of the sinus cavity, as you can see in part A here. They classically get a bit of mucus trapping. They often get barotrauma and other sort of secondary sinus dysfunction. Uh, but they really have an inhalant allergy. And therefore, in part C here, you can see how the edema and polypoid change is actually coming off the turbinate and the uncinate itself. It's not actually coming out of the sinus cavity. And therefore, when you look at a scan, such as the young girl in the middle here, she really has this thickening all in the center part of her scan and her peripheral or superior and lateral sinuses are all normal. This has actually been referred to as the black halo sign by uh, Valerie Lund many years ago, when she described the same phenomenon. Let's go on to our more classic ECRS, because CCAD being an exuberant allergic rhinitis is typically more in younger patients with a good history for inhalant allergy. Whereas ECRS is this condition, this is true sort of eosinophilic nasal polyposis. It's often associated with adult onset asthma and will either occur in patients in their 30s to 50s where they have absolutely no history of prior sinus disease, or if they have a history of airway problems, it was just simply a simple allergy that got better when they were younger and they went through a well period for many years of their life. And, and they often say in a report that my sinus came back. Well, well, what they're really describing is simple allergy like occurs at many people in the population when you were younger, but they've developed now eosinophilic airway inflammation. And like I said, it's almost always associated with adult onset asthma and is not really an IgE mediated or driven condition. This is a TH2 driven condition. And this is the condition in which uh, people are very corticosteroid responsive and that the new biologic agents that are available now really are targeting the type of inflammation that produces this condition. What about AFRS? Why well, we put AFRS here because it is can also be bilateral because it is a hypersensitive disorder and very quickly because one gets edema in, and expands cell changes in the sinus cavity, the next functional group gets involved. And it's not uncommon for people to present with these very expanded remodeled sinuses. And they have the classic dark signal on both T1 and T2 MRI scans seen here in C and B accordingly uh, that represents the fungal material. Once again, these are younger patients. And we know that by simply removing the fungal elements, 
restoring mucociliary clearance either within nasal irrigation or eventually getting autonomous function back will actually keep a lot of these patients um, happy. And uh, I must say that EPOS 2020 does a great job at describing the evidence base for the various treatments and immunotherapy and other agents that have been used in managing this condition. Now, last one here is what about diffuse patients that don't have a TH2 dominant condition? Well, these are patients that are generally what we call non-ECRS. They often will have a poor response to corticosteroid. So ECRS patients and TH2 dominant conditions, especially ECRS, if you give them steroid, they'll often say, look, I feel better within a few days, the smell comes back. The non-TH2 group will not have that wonderful response from corticosteroids, or if they do get a response, it takes a very big dose. And they tend to be older and smokers. Now, this is often on the back of Justin Turner's work as well from Vanderbilt, who described um, uh, the sort of uh, cytokine profile that occurs in this older, older patient set. And here's an example of a woman in her mid-50s who really didn't respond to corticosteroid. She's got a diffuse condition and she also has lower airway disease that didn't respond to a corticosteroid inhaler. She was given corticosteroids many times from uh, previous uh, physicians. And when she eventually had a biopsy, there were very few eosinophils here. And it wasn't simply an infective process. She's had very good surgery done. And this is the group that have been known and shown to respond to macrolide treatments because that has an anti-IL-8 and non-TH2 type response. And so there are some as emerging evidence that there are some specific treatments targeted towards this non-eosinophilic non-TH2 diffuse condition. And likely this is a space in which new things will occur over time. And polyps, or not polyps, doesn't separate this patient out from the other examples given. So this is why a new classification system is critical. Let's move on then to secondary CRS. So once again, we describe it as localized or diffuse, because localized is important because it means then that there is some local pathology causing the sinus disease. And this can be anything from a dental infection, foreign body or fungal ball, a tumor. So let's have a look at these. Here's a person with a periapical abscess of their tooth that's already had endodontic treatment. And you can see that they have this purulent edema within the middle meatus and part C. And in part D, you can see some purulent secretions coming down. But, but part A shows the periapical abscess. And part B shows that it's very anatomically restricted. So this is the, your classic odontogenic sinusitis. Many of these patients, just by treating the tooth alone, will get better. Some of them need a combination of simple surgery plus the dental intervention. But, but it is not a primary CRS. It is really a secondary disorder. What about fungal ball? Well, fungal ball is a good example of a localized problem in which the foreign body material in terms of the fungal debris accumulates in the sinus and then causes this situation. Now, whether or not the reason the fungus occurs is because there's an inherent problem with the sinus or whether the sinus becomes dysfunctional down the track is another debate to be had. But it, in essence, is a foreign body reaction to fungal material sitting in the sinus cavity. There's not the eosinophilic mucin that you see in TH2 disorders. It really is a f more of a foreign body type reaction with just the material sitting in the sinus cavity. There's no expansile bone. So this is fungal ball. And finally, people who like this young man, you can see the neoosteogenesis on part A. This is the classic sort of hallmark sign of inverted papilloma. And you can see he has a fair bit of sinus dysfunction around his papilloma. This MRI scan shows the soft tissue component, but there's a lot of edematous component of the sinus cavity due to having a tumor sitting in the sinus cavity. So this is a secondary sinus disease related to a local tumor being present in the sinus cavity. Once again, it's localized, the other side's normal. There might be some minor change on the other side, but it's within normal range. And so this is why this is a localized, local pathology and tumor causing this sinus dysfunction. Now, when we talk about diffuse conditions for secondary CRS, it means that there's something else going on in the body's ability to fight and control mucosal disease. And they really break into three groups. There's the mechanical group, well, this relates to mucociliary function. There's the inflammatory group, and this mainly relates to autoimmune conditions. And those who have immune problems, and this mainly is immunodeficiency. Let's look at the mechanical. So the two most well-known mechanical ones are primary ciliary dyskinesia, cystic fibrosis. So 
This young girl here, who also has a sibling who has PCD, or primary ciliary dyskinesia, presents with chronic pseudomonal colonization. She gets mucus pooling in the, in the floor of her maxillary sinuses, and she has sort of more parlance secretions on, on, a, on her scan. This is classic PCD. And then we probably don't need much of an introduction to people who have cystic fibrosis. Here's the classic scans of a cystic fibrosis patient with hypoplasia of the sinuses, hypoplastic frontals. And of course, these patients have a problem with their CTFR um, uh, and chloride channel uh, uh, protein. And, and that's for therefore they get thick mucus and they get impaired mucus ciliary clearance rather than it being a disorder of the cilia themselves. But once again, a mechanical issue and often then associated with chronic pseudomonal colonization. Now, diffuse patients who have an inflammatory disorder include things like um, uh, GPA uh, or granulomatous polyangitis. And um, this is Wagner's as well as Shirk Strauss. Um, well, this is eosinophilic uh, granulomatous polyangitis. So this is a, a case of um, Shirk Strauss. Um, uh, these autoimmune conditions that are often anchor positive you know, they end up having scans that look like this. So this is someone with with Wagner's granulomatosis. They've never had surgery and they get this sort of destructive change to their sinus cavity. But these patients get other issues. They get they get their Wagner's granulomatosis in their lungs. They get it in their ears. Their kidneys get involved. So it's really not a sinus dis disorder. It is a broader autoimmune condition in the body. Let's look at the final one. This is people who have uh, immunity issues or immunodeficiency. Um, these are patients who have selective IgA deficiency, combined variable immune deficiency, and probably poorly controlled diabetes fits in here. And, and I, you know, I don't have that many of these patients. I don't really think you know, immune deficiency makes up a huge amount of uh, our patient population. But, but this is the lady who had CVID, and, and she would at one time get recurrent effective problems in her sinuses. Here you can see at one point in time, she's got it in the right frontal and left sphenoid, and then another time she would present and it'd be another different pattern and, and shift, but they would resolve in between and then flare again. And she had CVID. And so really getting someone like this right is acknowledging the secondary issues, just as we did in the mechanical and inflammatory groups that, that these patients need management of their underlying combined variable immunodeficiency rather than just local treatments alone. Now that's the secondary group. Let's move on now to EPOS 2020 and the classification that was adopted by the group. It's very, very similar to what I've described then. Um, it's a great article to read. Uh, the Grayson et al. Um, uh, publication is, is cited there and is, is where the my first slides came from. Um, and the EPOS group really took on much of this, so localized and diffuse, the same endotype dominance, and allergic fungal sinusitis. They, they called it isolated sinusitis, which I think is quite a good term. Um, we talked about ECRS, AFRS, CCAD. I, I guess the CRS with nasal polyps was included here as the majority of those patients have eosinophilic polyposis, but probably is not a good acronym to leave into this classification system. And I really think just ECRS should be used. And then there's the non-ECRS group that we've described, which, which I think is fair enough. There's not enough data here to talk about this any further, but there's emerging data such as from Justin Turner's work. And, and I think that's an interesting space as to what sort of treatments such as the macrolide responding group that we've published on. Secondary ECRS is exactly the same as what's described to me, local pathology, meaning those type of conditions and the mechanical inflammatory and immunity issues that can produce the, the three sets of conditions that I showed you before. Now, now, now this is not supposed to be all encompassing and comprehensive. There may be phenotypes that I haven't touched on here, but hopefully they fit into this schema that allows us now to very much talk about what is the underlying issues? Is there a local anatomical issue? at the heart of the problem. So that, that's, that's this localized group. They, they're likely to need surgery. And then what is the endotype dominance? Because that helps to direct the average clinician who's, who's reading about CRS or learning about it for the first time to understand why we do some of the interventions we do. Are we doing it to suppress an abnormal TH2 response or not? 
Uh, and when, when do we use corticosteroids and when do we not because of that dominance in primary disease? And then here in secondary disease, it highlights the importance of managing those mechanical inflammatory and, and immune factors that, that contribute to the condition. Look, thank you very much for listening. And I hope that's put some light on the new classification system that I think really is going to move our profession forward in, in how we teach new doctors how to think about CRS that has a much more relevance to our understanding of the condition and what treatment options are available. Thank you so much.